This video is brought to you by Law Excellence IAS Academy. Dear students, good morning. Welcome to Deep Daily Editorial Enrichment Program of Law Excellence R&D. Let us start the discussion on today's newspaper that is 9th July 2019. The first article for discussion, a regrettable conviction. This article is about sedition law which is part of Indian Penal Code under Section 124A. So any sedition, act of sedition is punishable with three years of imprisonment minimum. The maximum can be life imprisonment. In this context, let us see the origins of this tradition, sedition law. Historically, the colonial administration it wanted to regulate any kind of speeches that are detrimental to the state and government of the day. So, the sedition law was enacted to protect the colonial interests. After independence, the same section 124A is still continuing. In this context, how it is been used, 124A is more used to curtail the political dissent. You know political dissent is critical for democracy. So, impatience towards this political dissent is antagonistic towards the democracy. So, there are certain instruments which are going or curtailing this political dis dissent. One is sedition law. The second is defamation act. In India, defamation is a criminal law. So, in these circumstances, let us understand the difference between anti-state action and anti-national action. What do we mean by anti-state? So, criticizing the government of the day and expressing displeasure towards the government of the day it is anti-state action. Criticizing state institutions, it is no wrong. It is essential in a democracy and it is within the scope of, scope of the democratic functioning. On the other hand, anti-national action. Developing the rivalry between various social groups in India, hate speeches, all these comes under the anti-national action. Today, we shall differentiate between anti-state and anti-national action before applying the sedition law. Anti-state action is within the scope of the democratic debate and dissent. Anti-national action has to be curbed with the iron fist. Now, the governments with their little impatience, they are concluding the anti-state action as anti-national and they are at knee-jerk reaction as a knee-jerk reaction applying this sedition law. So, my take home point is this. The political dissent and free speech, if they are protected, the democracy will prosper. And second point, Supreme Court has given clear guidelines to the courts when to punish the people under sedition law. So any sedition or any hate speech has to inflict violence. So any infliction of the violence which is directly related to the speech of the individual, that can be considered as sedition not the other things. So in this case, Mr. Waiko has made a pro-LTTE speech which has been constructed as a sedition and been awarded punishment by the Madras High Court. Now it has been challenged in the Supreme Court. So the speech of Mr. Waiko has inflicted violence or not or is there immediate response which has led to communal hatred or regional hatred etc is not been proven do not exist in this case so remember this from the perspective of limitations of free speech in india so sedition laws anti defamation laws all these are the limitations to free speech and the next is a myopic view of foreign made generic drugs so this this topic can be understood as the upcoming challenges to the pharmaceutical sector in India. So, the biggest market today for the generic drugs in India is United States of America. In this case, USA, the companies, multinational companies are very much worried about the Indian generic drug industry because our drugs are very cheap. The generic drugs are the copies of the original composition and these will be produced after the patent is over. So, in those circumstances, the generic drugs are many times of cheaper cost. In Africa, the fight against uh, this AIDS was very much successful because of the low-cost drugs provided by the Indian companies. So, in this case, 
FDA recently has started inspecting various manufacturing units of Dr. Reddy's, Ranbaxy, etc. And it is stating that the drug manufacturing there is contaminated. Here, what is the meaning of contamination? It has not been clearly stated. So, there is a law, Food Security Modernization Act in the United States of America. According to this act, the Food and Drug Administrator, Administration, the regulator in the United States of America, has to coordinate with the other regulators across the world to maintain good manufacturing practices. These are called common good manufacturing practices across the world with regard to drugs are concerned. But that is not happening. The next is, in USA, the definition is adulterated drugs, not contaminated drugs. Let's take, a tap is not working and there is contaminated water coming from the tap. The second is dangerous and there is another concept called spurious drugs. Here the manufacturer, he tries to create a wrong drug, a cheaper drug or disproportionate composite content just to make maximize profit. So here the spurious drugs are being made with wrong intent. The contamination drugs are made due to unhygienic practices. So many of the manufacturing units are getting disqualified because of the condition of contamination and what constitutes the contamination is still now not defined. So that's the reason why FDA, the US Food and Drug Regulator is more becoming a global vigilant rather than working with the regulatory agencies that are existing in the developing countries. So in this context, India has to raise the concerns about the generic drug market of Indians in Euro United States of America. That has to be considered as a trade issue. The next, enforcing the caste hierarchies. So this article is about reservations given to Marathas. So let's know the brief. So a special category was created that is called as social and educationally backward classes. So under this category, only the group which was given the reservations were Marathas. And these reservations to the Marathas was upheld by the Bombay High Court. In this context, Marathas are politically powerful and they want to convert their political power into economic opportunity. So, they want to get themselves equated with other backward classes or scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. The reservation for the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes was provided on the basis of discrimination. The historical factor of untouchability and discrimination has provided them with this. So, in this scenario, in India, the discrimination factor is still exists for scheduled castes as a justification for reservation. But... The land owning class like Marathas, Patidars in Gujarat, and Kapus in Andhra Pradesh, Jats in Rajasthan, all these people demanding for reservation have certain interesting factors. The first is um, agrarian crisis. These were land owning class. Today, as the service sector is booming up, this land owning class failed to shift their economic presence from one style to the other style. And agrarian distress also has diminished the economic might which they had. Then the second thing is, they are seeing a, a sense of disempowerment. Previously, there used to be an economic and a social gap between the land owning classes and landless. Land owning itself is a power. Land is a power. It's an economic power. It converts into political power. So there is a sense of disempowerment among the land owning class as opportunities are being shifted away from them. And the third thing, after the LPG era, the companies are many of the intermediate castes which are, which are engaged in small scale industries and small scale manufacturing, they shifted or they lost their might and multinational companies, bigger companies started gaining that. So sense of economic loss, and uh, the fear of political loss uh, and also loss of economic control after LPG era and agrarian crisis. All these have made these social groups to demand for uh, economic opportunities through reservations. Uh, and 
the most important criteria that has to be seen to understand uh, the reservation policy is backwardness so there is a survey indian human development uh, survey according to this marathas are stated to be not backward so there are various criteria which it has taken one is the number of years of education access to electricity per capita consumption etc when these are observed these are below the brahmins but they are equivalent to the other upper caste and also the obcs so it means that they are on par with existing other social groups which are so called as upper caste in this context for economically poor among the upper caste economically backward classes section was created and reservations were provided under that under 103 constitutional amendment act when these are in equal status when compared to the other upper caste why can't we provide them reservations only for economically backward classes under the existing reservation category why we have to provide for a blanket reservation for marathas irrespective of their financial position under a special category that is the first question and the reservations are meant for a particular historical injustice in india so many people who are the reason for the historical injustice getting affirmative action is actually is actually disempowering the people who are getting the reservations so it means rather than providing them with opportunities the marathas with new opportunities through reservations they are been eating into the opportunities which are already existing and private sector jobs are increasing today and public sector are decreasing it means that the base itself is eroding when base is eroding then taking up the reservations is unwarranted and that will eat away into the reservations of the existing social groups and finally remember quotas are not a way out for economic progress so quotas they can do very limited action and these are the opportunities only on the public sector front so enlargement of the social safety nets economic opportunities in the private sector creating a booming economic growth this is how the government has to think and finding a political easy way out through quotas is a wrong which or else is going to be harmful in the long run these are the points you remember so quotas will strengthen and perpetuate the caste system and quotas have become very divisive in india so that's the reason why the indian political class has to be very careful before introducing the quota the next is the visible hand so this is about coalition politics so a coalition government is in power in karnataka which is made up of congress and jds and then another party which is powerful over there was bjp and this bjp emerged as the single largest party in the elections but the coalition which has got the sufficient numbers was invited to form the government in this context the coalition governments are more or less unstable and this instability is induced by the government in power at the center so the party in power at the center is bjp it is trying to use its might to create something called as instability and also the no confidence again is the existing government so how this is being played certain members of the congress party they have resigned to congress party saying that their interests are not been taken care of and the second the people so resigned if their resignations are been accepted by the speaker they immediately get the attraction of the anti defection law so when they attract the anti defection law the strength of the house will fall it means the effective majority comes down so when effective majority comes down then the no confidence motion can be introduced and it can be easily passed in the house and as independent members are today supporting the bjp obviously bjp will be positive by one number this can only happen if the 13 members who are rebels again in the congress has to resign so in this case the most important office to decide is the office of the speaker and the second most important office is the governor and governor is the one who has to call the house for session and uh, he has to make the house to 
or else uh, the no confidence motion or he shall allow for the introduction of the no confidence motion that is speaker so governor has to call the house for assemble and the speaker has to call for house to uh, admit the no confidence motion so let us wait and see but central government playing havoc with the politics within the state our state politics is not in the spirit of cooperative federalism or with team india the second is um, the african logic a short at economic logic so this is about free trade agreement with african union so let us see how africa is seen by the global major powers china has saw africa only as a country for raw material and if you see united states of america and multinational oil companies saw the nile river as a oil base and china went ahead it started various infrastructure projects which are strategically important so in these circumstances african union has made a significant move forward towards creation of africa's free trade agreement here we need to know that african market is increasing why the young population in africa is increasing with higher population which is in consumptive border or within the consumptive zone will automatically create a new demand and this demand if it is been well captured by india then india's exports will increase as on today african market is of the size of 1.2 billion people and close to 3 to 4 billion dollars so this market is fast enlarging and india has to make a cash into it here india has to make itself differentiated from china china is more seen with contempt rather than as a partner india shall become more as a partner and thanks to our forefathers they laid strong foundations based on principles in our relations with africa non alignment movement afro afro asian summit all these are the foundations made by the nehru so india's engagement before with africa was more principle centric today it is becoming economic centric so in this context africa shall not see india on par with china and it has to be seen more as partner in development that is the essence in this case what are the challenges which we are going to face african union's goal though is admirable the capabilities of african union are not very strong and whatever the african unity project which has been started is not successful till date if you remember gaddafi who was killed in libya he was the person who started this african unity project which did not go well and the second is colonialism or colonial factors these have destroyed all the internal trade mechanisms and internal trade routes that were existing over there it means that this destruction of the internal trade routes have decreased the trade among the countries and increased the trade of africa with the outside countries rebuilding these trade routes is very much essential now so it means a huge infrastructure expenditure is necessary within africa for for its trade and the third thing is today globally there are headwinds for free trade it means that the protectionism is increasing us china india everyone are on the trade uh, tariff war now so when among is these headwinds uh, to what extent this free trade agreement will move forward is a question and the second there is a very low manufacturing base in uh, africa and complementarities has to exist for the trade to grow there are no much complementarities between the countries uh, and then african uh, africa as a country is of immense opportunity for india because of various reasons the first being cultural connect which we had economic connect which we had added to that africa is a resource mine of the world in this context india can bring in a free trade agreement wherever possible co production it has to build the capabilities of the african union to make this free trade agreement to move forward these all can enrich our relations with the african union and the next article congress opposes jellian wala bag this is the news article so what is this jellian wala bag bill remember there is a jellian wala bag memorial trust in which all of them are the officials only one that is indian congress president he is the person who is a non official 
So in these circumstances, Prime Minister, INC President, Culture Minister, Leader of Opposition in Lok Sabha are the members of this trust. Now the BJP government is introducing a bill to remove INC President from this trust membership. And the next, Rajya Sabha to clears Aadhaar bill. What is this Aadhaar bill? So Supreme Court has given a judgment that the private entities cannot collect data, Aadhaar data compulsory from the citizens. Now what this states is, um, the, the parliamentary law makes it voluntary for the people to submit Aadhaar as an identity for getting a mobile connection. It means that uh, the company can request for Aadhaar as an identity and if a person is interested to take that connection, he can submit Aadhaar as an identity. So if you take Reliance, Geo, it has collected all the identities, Aadhaars of the people and connected their mobile phones to the Aadhaar identity. So this can be brought in back from the back door now. And in this context, the Congress is criticizing that it is against to them uh, the judgment of the courts. So see, the parliament can, by law, override the judgment of the court. So can undo the judgment of the court. But it can also be challenged in the court under the judicial review. And the next is, there is a law that is called data protection law. The biggest concern with the other is the privacy. So in this context, uh, there is a demand for the early enactment of the, uh, the Data Protection Act in India. And the next, uh, the existing law itself, there are stringent punishment for violation of uh, provisions of the Aadhaar data. So there is one crore penalty and a jail term for private entities if they misuse uh, Aadhaar data. The next, RBI board finalizes Utkarsh 2022. What is this Utkarsh 2022? It is to improve supervisory and regulatory function of RBI over Indian banking sector. And the next, towards a free trade agreement. So India, USA have many trade issues now. Strategically, they are friends. But by the trade aspect is concerned, they more are fighting as enemies today. So in this case, what United States of America is demanding, relaxation of e-commerce norms and then providing for free flow of data and US is also asking for decrease in tariffs in India and in this context it also has become punitive and India is being removed from the general system of generalized system of preferences which could have provided for more trade opportunities to India. In this context what the author suggests is rather than dealing the matter at the highest level we can bring in the uh, US trade representative and minister for commerce uh, to engage more frequently and more discretion has to be given to them and second US has separated trade staff who are experts in bargaining India do not have the same so in this context India first concludes and then it repents that's why a separate pool of officers called as a trade staff uh, need to be developed by India. These are the two suggestions which are given in this article. And the next, UN report legitimizes terror. UN Human Rights Council, it has stated that India and Pakistan are not taking, are not taking enough steps uh, to eliminate the human rights violations in Kashmir. Remember carefully, India says that the Office of High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights, this especially this office, is very prejudiced against India. So, by calling India and Pakistan together, this office is trying to hyphenate India and Pakistan. So, India is a vibrant democracy. Pakistan is stated to be more military, militarian and also Pakistan's uh, uh, sponsorship of the state uh, terrorism is known across the globe. So India is not willing to be hyphenated itself with the Pakistan. This is the essence of this article. And the next is the UA, UAPA bill draconian not based on logic. Unlawful activities uh, prohibition bill. In this a new provision that has been coming up through amendment that government can declare any suspect as a terrorist. 
it means that if the government had a doubt on me because of my po political position whatever it may be government can sub be suspicious and government can post me as an uh, individual terrorist so a new category is coming in indian legal lexicon that is called individual terrorist so it goes again as the legal uh, taxonomy or maxim that no person is guilty unless proven otherwise so beyond doubt it has to be established but here what is the government is trying to do a suspect he will be branded as an individual terrorist if the government is suspicious about him so it means mere on suspicion a person is labeled as a terrorist in the government records it is unwarranted and the second is national investigation act agency act nia act is also being amended the reason is to make the nia an investigation agency concerned with the needs of every indian if any terror attack happens against india or indian assets abroad that can be brought under the control of the nia investigation and in this context the opposition makes an uh, criticism that the nia like institutions were not given complete political control it means they are under the political control they are not been given complete autonomy or freedom to investigate in india the biggest problem with regard to investigative agencies are they are not under the control of the, uh, the sorry they are under the excessive control of the politics the political interference is the major challenge and then finally thank you very much have a great day all the best